and I can say a welcome to the session on the built environment, transport and energy. Uh, my name is Pete Garside. I'm the uh, head of geography at Kingston University. So we've got a vested interest in not just from a departmental perspective, but also from the university's perspective in a lot of this um, transition to the green economy. Uh, today, uh, you've already met Neil. Neil's gonna, gonna co-facilitate this process um, and keep an eye on, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna keep an eye on questions, etc. but Neil's gonna be uh, going through the slides, helping the, the, the speakers to uh, actually do their transition as well. Um, I think we've got all of our speakers with us so we can crack on. Um, bit of housekeeping in terms of order, et cetera, and what we're gonna do just so everybody's aware of the process. Um, effectively, we've got four, well, we've actually got, we managed to squeeze five people into this session. Uh, we've got um, initial uh, presentation from uh, Tim Rose and Maria. Bukali, uh, Tim and Maria, uh, both under the umbrella of EDF, uh, but Tim from Pivot Power um, working with EDF and uh, Maria uh, working in the uh, research and development section there. Then we're going to be moving on to uh, Ben Knowles, who's going to be discussing these um, projects in terms of Pedal Me and Pedal Powered Services. Uh, we've got uh, Hassan Horoglu, who's a colleague of mine from Kingston University. He's a uh, head of uh, civil surveying and construction management. And then we're going to finally have uh, Nathan James Van Gambling, uh, who's an award-winning uh, podcast, Beta Talk, um, details issues around um, energy and um, development issues so hopefully that's the slides that will come your way fairly shortly each speaker will uh, introduce themselves um, a couple of key points just to throw out there uh, that um, the RBK people wanted me to flag up one was the, there is an ongoing survey at the moment about the introduction of electric vehicles and the use of cargo bikes and whether or not businesses who are thinking about uh, innovating their transport uh, approach, whether or not they want to be involved in that. There's an actual survey going on at the moment, and I'll put that into the chat. If people want to fill that out, that's great. So we're going to go through the presentations first, and then we'll have time for a discussion, and I'll try and keep people to time and report back to the main group as well. So I'm going to hand over, uh, first of all, I think, um, Tim, would you like to... Uh, take the first session and then hand that over to Maria, who's your uh, partner in crime in this first presentation. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Pete. I think it's going to be the other way around, actually, because we'll see which slide comes up first. Oh, okay. But, uh, on, but either, nice either way, either way um, if you if you move on to the first slide, we'll see if it's, uh, yeah, you go. I think this is, uh, Maria, are you going to, you're going to kick off um, yeah. a little bit about your idea? Oh, yeah. I can go, yes. So okay. good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, uh, uh, besides, uh, you know, working in the energy field, I am actually a Sarbiton resident, so a neighbor to, to, to a lot of you. So I'm very, very pleased to be here. Uh, so maybe we can go to the next slide. So as already been mentioned, I mean, I work uh, for EEDF Energy, but in particular for the R&D uh, part of, uh, of EDF. So obviously the EDF group, I mean, here in the UK and abroad has got some very key focus area um, of development uh, and the consolidation. So here in the UK, our research center uh, is focusing on uh, um, uh, five uh, key main themes, in particular um, relevant for today's call um, um, around renewables energy, customers, uh, that's my team, and digital innovation. So within EDF Energy R&D, um, I lead, a, I'm a research manager, uh, so I lead a team of, uh, of uh, engineers, engineers and economists uh, that uh, work um, around developing models uh, for, um, for our colleagues, team, for example, for Field of Power around evaluation of uh, battery, battery plus uh, renewable uh, generation projects. 
Um, we also work, and again, today, very relevant to today's call, on what we call uh, uh, new new local energy markets. So obviously, I mean, there is the well-established uh, large uh, wholesale um, um, electricity, gas uh, markets. But then we are seeing, uh, as we have more and more smaller distributed generation and just been mentioned EVs, which are not, uh, we are, which can be considered also as a very flexible uh, type of uh, loads, uh, dispatchable loads. So we are uh, in my team exploring uh, what could be a um, new type of forms, I mean, new type of smaller local energy markets that are really driven uh, rather than from up to, to, to down to actually bottom up. So maybe if we go to the next slide, I can just um, explain a little bit about project that uh, I have been leading in, uh, in Brixton is called Community. So uh, it's, um, it's, um, it's actually just finished right now at the end of April. So it's a trial um, involving the development of a local energy market uh, based on peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So if you see, this is the building, this is uh, the Logborough estate, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, close by to Brixton. And you can see it's a typical, um, you know, uh, block of flats uh, with some existing, it's tiny, sorry, I, I was only allowed two slides, so I could not put big pictures, but so I tried to put, you know, but you know, there is existing PV on the roof. And basically what we have done as a part of a trial, we have created a commercial scheme that allows the residents in the building to access the solar energy generated by the PV. And then we have also complicated a little bit more uh, by giving them really empowering, rather than just being passively allocated, um, to empower them so they can decide what they do with this uh, allocation of solar energy. So hence, uh, you know, you see this scheme on, uh, on the right. Uh, as a default, they use the solar energy when they need it. Uh, if uh, there is an excess, they can decide what they do. So they can sell it or donate to their neighbors and through an app. You see, this is uh, the system, yeah. Uh, so the project, uh, it's, um, it's um, as a second step, we have also installed a small community battery because there is quite a lot of um, interest now uh, in, uh, you know, providing flexibility, even at very, you know, low voltage, small scale residential level. This is something, I mean, it's not there yet, but there is a lot of from the DN, the local DNO. So we have done a second part of this project with UK power networks, which we have installed a battery and the battery is part of this local energy market. But then depending on the, uh, the DNO, uh, it's called to operate flexibly. So one thing maybe to mention, I think when we talk about local energy markets and, you know, it's a regulation never forget, besides commercials. Um, so this project was enabled by Ofgem, uh, the gas and electricity regulator, uh, in particular around uh, um, informing uh, uh, the participants on how you know, this mechanism works so they can make informed decisions and, uh, and also they are protected so they are never worse off. I think I could speak a lot about this project for a very long time, but you know, that's a, just a teaser and I'm very happy to ask uh, questions. I think Tim, next it's you. Yeah, um, thank you, Maria. And, and I will try to be very brief. I know we've only supposed to have a few minutes between us on this. Thank you. Um, okay. I, I, uh, I'm also a resident uh, like Maria, um, also work for EDF Energy, but a different part. Um, I, I work for a company called Pivot Power and we, um, we build very large batteries and, and high powered EV networks. Um, and I just wanna spend a couple of minutes introducing a project in Oxford, which might have some pointers for smart sort of energy systems here in Kingston and how we develop our strategy. So we're working with Oxford City Council, uh, with the University of Oxford uh, and a number of other industrial partners on the project, which forms a key part of Oxford's plans to reach net zero. Uh, which they are ambitiously targeting by 2040. So um, they are bit, they are pretty ambitious. Um, but this is this is a core part of, of that sort of scheme. So the project is an R and D, a UK research and innovation demonstrator, part funded by Innovate UK, and it's offering a model for future smart local energy systems across the UK. Um, and this is how it works. So if you just move to the next slide, um, 
we're building a very large battery and you can see down in the right in the right hand corner at the main substation in in oxford um, and the purpose of this is just kind of a bit more of a national rather, rather than a, a regional level but this is to stable help stabilize the grid and really to allow more and wind solar generation so we intend to be building a number of these batteries but in this project very big battery 50 megawatt battery down there and we're also building and this blue line is um, represents an eight kilometer private cable to de deliver lots and lots of power from that uh, main substation to a public charging super hub um, at one of the city's park and rides in the west of the city. So you can see there along the ring road of, King, of um, uh, Oxford uh, delivering power to this Red Bridge park and ride. So people will be able to come there, charge their cars, uh, et cetera, fast or slow as, as they want to. And then the next, uh, just move on, thank you. Um, and then we're installing 100 ground source heat pumps in and around the city. Uh, and these are gonna use smart controls to allow residents to heat their homes uh, at cheaper times of day using time of use or what we call agile tariffs. And this can save them between 25 and 50% on heating bills, uh, as well as offer higher levels of comfort uh, you know, in the social housing homes that we're installing these in. So it's a, a multifaceted project, it's quite exciting. Um, and this is stage one of the projects. If you move to the next slide. So over the next few years, we aim to provide power to a new fleet of fully electric buses through the same network. You can see the bus depot down there and the, the, the full Oxford um, Council fleet vehicle uh, fleet is also going to be moving to that park and ride. So we're going to be charging those 300 odd vehicles ultimately as well. So um, uh, we've got, this is the first such project, I say it's a demonstrator, but Pivot Power is planning 40 of these projects around the country. Um, uh, so we're rolling those out on the next decade or so. Uh, the, the next two in Coventry and Birmingham are already in development. Um, so this is, uh, you know, at the moment, this one's supported, but the others won't be. They're really economically viable projects. Now, not, just to finish, I mean, not all of this is going to be suitable or appropriate necessarily for Kingston, but as, you know, as a resident here, I'd like to believe there are parts of this we can learn from. Um, this is about sort of learning, uh, understanding how we in, in integrate power, transport and heat. And, and I'd love to see how we can bring elements of this, and particularly maybe the heat, heat pumps and EV um, types of uh, activity here to Kingston. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, very brief introduction to the project. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. And thanks, Tim. Um, and just to flag this up, obviously, if people have got specific questions, um, if we can put those through into the chat and I can collate those and bring them everybody back into that once we've been through the presentations. So next up, we've got Ben, Ben Knowles, um, and Ben's going to be uh, discussing his project on Pedal Me. Thanks, Ben. He's Ben with us. <laughs> Maybe we haven't got I am ben. indeed. We have got Ben with us. Fantastic. I was just about to skip over you then, Ben. Great. I'll leave it, I'll leave it up to you. Thank you. Amazing. Hello. Uh, my name is Ben Knowles. I'm the writer and chief exec at Pedal Me. You can probably hear I'm sat by the side of a road at the minute, um, a cafe. So um, we operate an on demand uh, taxi and logistics service. Um, one of the um, things that's integral to our service is that we are operated, our senior staff are also trained to ride. And that means that uh, we can get to more jobs and um, we don't pay twice to have people as contingency and also to um, do desk jobs. So I'm doing my desk job right now, but sat by the side of the road. I hope the uh, sound quality is not too bad. Um, so we have very special bikes ridden by very special people and that allows us to do jobs by bike that wouldn't otherwise be possible by bike um so this is a nice little video illustration of that um so can you just play the video so this load... the PDF, so the video won't play sorry oh nightmare okay okay um move on to the next slide then please Um, in general, so as a company, we do, we do jobs that other people couldn't do by bike. And the fact that we can cover a little bit more ground, um, a little bit quicker, and because we can carry slightly bigger loads, um, that adds up to make a really big difference to how clients experience our service. 
um, we grew from two people in 2017 to some 55 staff today. Uh, and us leading by example has also um, encouraged lots of other people to consider using cargo bikes in slightly less ambitious ways, but still in useful ways. Um, the premise of Pedal Me is essentially that motor vehicles are not a very efficient way of getting most logistics jobs done. Um, and uh, bikes are just much better for most movements needed in cities. Thank you, my friends. Um, so if we just go back one to the... Uh, so this is... Um, this is uh, an example of a, a, ha a house move, flat move being done by bike. This is the sort of job that we can do. Um, and to be honest, mostly these jobs are to help capture uh, people's imagination and get them really thinking about what is possible by bike. Um, I used to be a transport planner. I worked for um, uh, a council in London running disruptive transport projects and one of the things that people said to me when i said well maybe you could consider using a, a bike to uh to get to work was that um they felt that they couldn't carry their their bag with me, with them to get to work they couldn't carry their laptop um i hope i like to think that when people see someone moving house by bike it makes them really think about quite what is possible and quite how many trips they could be making individually by bike too um, bikes have always been uh, like my secret advantage over everyone else in the sense that because all of my journeys are a little bit shorter and a little bit more flexible, um, I can do more in the same time. And that's always provided an advantage for me, no matter what job I was doing. So when I was a, a chemist um, working for GlaxoSmithKline, um, I used to ride to work um, and understanding the power of using bikes to... Um, move people and things has given me this um, opportunity to start this company that's come this far. The next slide, please. The other thing that makes this a bit unusual is that we carry people uh, and their dogs. Um, so um, we operate an on-demand taxi service. The key thing for us about carrying people is it shows what is possible, but it also ensures that our training is to a really high standard. It makes everyone take the training really seriously because we're carrying um, people's unaccompanied kids, um, elderly people. We carry people to, over the COVID period, we've been carrying people to hospital for chemotherapy where they wanted to avoid public transport or getting an enclosed space like a taxi. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just to illustrate a few of the ways that motor vehicles are a market failure, really. Um, motors are slow. Who knows how long the journey is going to take? And uh, there are all sorts of externalities that are associated with driving motors. Um, air quality, quality of life for people is a bit more of a subtle one but the constant noise and danger that's imposed by motor vehicles has quite a severe detrimental impact all across society. And you see that in the way, um, in particular, how children travel to school is like a key indicator of this because uh, parents are unable to allow their children to travel independently because of motor vehicles. And that in impacts their independence, their sense of freedom, but it also has a huge, creates a huge amount of economic drag because those parents, their time is valuable. They do not, it's, it's not the best possible use of their time to be transporting a nine, 10 year old kids to school. Um, it's great to do it occasionally. Um, and obviously there's the value of that bonding time with kids, but having the choice whether to do it or not is hugely empowering for kids. And you see that in other cities and in areas of the UK where um, we've been able to set the population free by reducing the danger of motor vehicles. 
tackling movements of commercial vehicles is key to that. You can't fix the road network without providing an alternative for businesses. And that is why we exist. There's, but there's not, it's not just that what we're doing is good for society. It's not good just that it's good for saving the planet. It's not just um, that we provide full-time employment to our staff rather than using contractors in the way that Uber or Addison Lee or any of those do. But we just provide a better service to our customers. We're quicker, we're more reliable, and people really enjoy receiving deliveries by bike. The next slide, please. A little bit about how we're different to other cycle logistics operators, but I don't want to dwell too much on that. Next slide. So quite often when I start talking about road transport and climate change, people say to me, well, this is kind of a solved problem really because we've got electric cars. Uh, we don't need to worry about this cycling thing. And it's true that electric vehicles offer, offer a considerable step in the right direction for those trips that we really can't convert from being done by motor vehicles. So for example, deliveries to construction sites are a great example. The, the payloads are often over a ton. That's not viable by cycle logistics and it makes complete sense that construction deliveries get delivered by electric vehicles. It also makes sense where you're amalgamating huge amounts of items together into a HGV. It makes completely sense that those are electric powered. But the problem is that if you're looking at just transitioning all of our current motor vehicle movements into electric, is that while it's a step in the right direction, there are still considerable CO2 emissions associated with electric vehicles. They're not zero emission. Nothing is zero emission. Um, and pretending that things are zero emission, in my view, is quite dangerous. Our service is not zero emission. So um, we've, we've written a white paper on this, um, looking into um, life, carried out a life cycle analysis, and we're producing about 30 grams of CO2 per kilometer covered uh, under the current conditions. We believe that we can reduce that by a factor of two. Um, by making changes to our operating practices, uh, changes to diet and changes to the design of our bikes to make them more efficient. But even under the current situation, the manufacturing CO2 for a single electric vehicle and the embedded carbon in, in making it, making the electric vehicle before it even rolls out of the garage is enough for us to build three bikes and cover 300,000 kilometers. So a lifetime's worth of use for that electric fan. So the, um, the advantage that we, we offer already, the advantage that cycling in general offers already for CO2 emissions compared to electric vehicle trips is huge. That's before you get into thinking about, are there enough, is there enough lithium in the ground to supply a whole world's worth of electric vehicles once we account for developing countries also needing to um, have access to mobility too. Um, next slide, please. Ben, could I ask you to draw this to a conclusion, please? Because we're trying to get another two speakers in after you. Yep, well. let's go. Thanks. Great. Okay, summary of this slide. We're way more efficient. We've done studies which show that that's the case. Cycle journeys are shorter, cycle journeys are faster. Next slide, please. Um, here are some examples of us bringing together big cons multiple consignments from different clients onto the same bike using the fact that we highly train our staff. Next slide, please. Uh, here's someone on their way to get vaccinated. We're doing free rides for people getting to their vaccinations. Next slide, please. Bikes are more resilient. They can operate in the snow and ice in conditions which motor vehicles struggle to operate in. This only applies if you train your riders to a really high level, of course. This is from the beast from the east in 2017. We were hugely busy. Other logistics operators essentially weren't operating. Um, and we gained a lot of clients in this time. Next slide, please. And I just want to quickly swipe through this, just showing what we do. 
Next slide, please. If you need deliveries doing in London, we can do them. If you need deliveries doing in Kingston, send us an email and we can talk about how we could make it work. Next slide, please. Uh, we've got a huge base in Southwark and we can do deliveries all across London from there. Next slide, please. Uh, but we can also sell you bikes, lease you bikes and train your staff to ride them. Next slide, please. Uh, so in summary, bikes are a much superior way of doing logistics in any urban or semi-urban environment. We provide a much better alternative. We can help you change how you're doing your logistics too. Get in touch. Next slide, please. Job done. Sorry if that was a bit longer than planned for. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sorry to interrupt you there, Ben, but yeah, that's really useful. Thank you very much. A detailed um, introduction and overview of the, the service. Okay, we're going to move swiftly on. Um, and Hassan, uh, are you uh, ready? Yeah, thanks, Pete. No problem. Over to you. Yeah, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is uh, this is Hassan, Dr. Hassan Arolo. I am the head of department for civil engineering, surveying, and construction management at Kingston University. So, I'm going to talk about four minutes about green construction and the skills required. Yeah, I'll do my best. So why, why built environment basically? It's because built environment contributes around 40% of the UK's total carbon footprint. And there are two things. So climate change and environmental degradation are jeopardizing the sustainability of human development, both social and economic. And uh, secondly, cities are actually rapidly urbanizing. So the demand for urban housing is greater than ever before. Uh, in fact, the urban populations are predicted to grow by 2.4 billion by 2050. So a 64% increase. So therefore implementation of green construction will be the defining challenge for the next generation of built environment professionals. And for this commitment, uh, businesses requires mainly uh, internal, uh, internal processes, uh, internal business practices and workforce. So they need to go green internally, basically. So this demonstrates uh, the firm's commitment to the process goes beyond uh, lip service. And the second thing is uh, staying on top of local uh, and global developments, uh, which means like keeping abreast of green construction techniques. Uh, and this takes a lot of work, but is essential uh, to stay competitive. Uh, firm can, sorry, Pete, can, can we go back? Uh, yeah, and, 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 and it's, it's important to designate a team within the firm that is responsible for tracking the latest developments and determining which are right for the company. Uh, and also find at least one member of each major department who can determine which green construction innovations are right to embrace. Okay, so next slide, please. So this, at the same time, moving towards a greener economy are creating opportunities new opportunities in technology, investments, and jobs. And these jobs help restore the environment and fight climate change. Uh, so realizing these opportunities will only be possible if we invest in the right skills and support an environmentally sustainable economy. This means rethinking how we construct things, uh, how we manufacture products, materials, and manage economies. Uh, this also means that new sets of skills for green jobs will be needed to achieve energy efficiency, reduction of waste, uh, manufacturing, as well as using low impact building materials, indoor air quality, providing indoor air quality and uh, improved safety and transportation systems. So for the skills strategy to be successful, there are some important building blocks. So, you, so we need to be forward looking and, and this should be evidence-based using new market information and based on uh, dialogue. Uh, this is linking uh, back to Audley's uh, talk. 
about uh, the dialogue and about uh, how new networks can be set up, how new partnerships can be set up, basically, and uh, encouraging a social dialogue between government, local authorities, as well as education providers. And the last one is hands-on practical training. Yes, education and training combined with hands-on experience. So, so I guess over-reliance on desk-based desk learning is failing to teach the technical skills and construction knowledge and approach needed to design uh, sustainable buildings, green construction. Uh, that's it, thanks. Great, Th thanks, Hassan. That's really, really brief and to, to the point. That's excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and then our final presentation is going to come from Nathan. And um, stand out by going beyond tick box efficiency measures. Hi, Nathan, are you with us? I am. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can indeed. I'll hand over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to the other speakers. Uh, <clears throat> It was interesting hearing Ben uh, speak. I nearly went out and bought a bike yesterday with my eight-year-old daughter and then uh, realised how would I get it home because I've got quite a small car. <laughs> so I'll have to have to work that one out. I'm going to use Ben actually as a, a bit of an example. Now, I imagine Ben is actually quite fit doing all that cycling. So I imagine his heart is quite efficient. Now, if you were to transplant his heart into my body, I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, I won't be cycling any further than what I can already do because my system... I'm a bit overweight. And one of the things we see in the heating industry is we have talk about heat pumps, we have talk about high efficient boilers, and we forget that the boiler is just a component of a system. Unless you get that whole system right, you're not gonna have your high efficient boiler and you're not gonna have your high efficient uh, heat pump. Now, I was born into the heating industry, I suppose. I mean, there's probably gonna be some of us on this, on this talk today that were, I was born in 1971. So the first uh, home I lived in didn't have central heating. Central heating is actually quite a new industry. Some of you probably would remember actually also growing up in homes that didn't have central heating. Uh, 60s, it started to sort of burgeon a little bit. And for the first time in human history, we managed to control flame. So we could control flame on and off with time and temperature. That had never been achieved before. And we started to do that with the oil pressure jet burner. And that's what my grandfather was involved in. He was seen as the lead combustion engineer in the UK and venerated throughout Europe. And then my great uncle was the energy manager for uh, Unilever. I wouldn't put myself in their league at all, but I do run a podcast about renewables and I do know the best renewable engineers in the country. So I suppose that's what I'm good at. And so we run a podcast where we talk about things like getting that system right. Otherwise, you're not going to get that efficiency. Um, and I can use, once again, Ben as an example. We've got these efficient boilers. We've got 6,000 boilers that go in daily in this country, working days, 6,000. Uh, they were badged up at around 93% efficiency back in 2005 when we were mandated to put condensing boilers in. But you'll find that nearly all of them condensing boilers aren't actually condensing properly because unless you get your flow temps down to at least 40, you won't get 93% efficiency. You might get people getting them down to about 53, uh, which is when condensing starts to happen, but you're, you're going to be no more efficient than the boiler you took out. So I think one of the ways businesses can sort of position themselves uh, with this growth around the sort of green um, industry is to actually go a little bit above and beyond the tick box measure. EPC is a classic example of a tick box measure. We go in, we tick that box to say it's an A-rated boiler. The fact that no one's actually turned that boiler on to see it works and they haven't looked at the system uh, is a problem. So I think there's a, a huge growth opportunity for people involved in heat pumps and heating to go a little bit beyond. Uh, if you can uh, put the next slide on, please. Uh, Neil or, or Pete. Heat pumps. We talk a lot about heat pumps. You may have heard people say you've already got one, you've got your fridge at home that works on refrigeration technology. Most of you have been heated by heat pumps. There's millions of them in London alone. So in your offices, in pubs, in clubs, in restaurants, uh, shops, supermarkets, the little test goes around the corner, they are all heated mostly with heat pump technology. Uh, you'll see the wall mounted uh, uh, unit there and you'll see the one in the ceiling. They are heat pump technology. They heat you and cool you. We call these split systems or VRF. Uh, so they're not new technology. Uh, the little image you see below uh, is on a building called Plum Centre. That's my local Plum Centre. Plum Centre are the largest distributor of boilers in this country. 
and they heat their stuff with heat pumps. Uh, so it's not you. And you can also see that that building hasn't been hysterically insulated because one of the myths we've got is that you have to hysterically insulate buildings before heat pumps work. You can heat a building with candles if you put enough candles in it. It's just not going to be very efficient. You're going to be buying lots of candles. And it's the same with any heat source. Any heat source uh, will benefit from good insulation. So you can heat buildings with heat pumps. We're doing it all the time in offices. I'm not saying that that efficient. And once again, we've got another business opportunity. I think the businesses, and we are seeing big businesses uh, using things like PAS 2060 and trying to become carbon neutral. But there is some very good monitoring equipment out there that makes you look transparent. Transparent, so you can with your smart meter see what energy is coming in, and then we can use things like heat meters to say what actual energy you use to heat your room. And I think that's going to make businesses a little bit more transparent than some of the greenwashing we do see. It's very easy to once again go again go into a a part room or an energy center of a big, big building, see all this wonderful technology like CHP, biomass, solar thermal, some of my best engineers I know will go into some of these buildings, universities, NHS buildings, and some of this stuff isn't even hooked up. Some of the flow temperatures on these massive, nice, brand new condensing boilers, 12 of them in a big building, flow temperatures of 80 degrees, they're never gonna condense, but they've got the tick. So I think the companies that are gonna be able to distinguish themselves are gonna be the ones that really sort of get a good understanding of how we can monitor stuff. Um, within the domestic market, we're gonna see this soon. We tend to use, uh, there's some good calculation software out there called Heat Engineer, but we're now starting to use measurement rather than calculation. You can actually go into homes and measure heat loss with equipment. So that's a new other business industry that I think is emerging. You can actually get accurate heat loss measurements and then you can work out what heating system. This whole idea that you've got a C-rated house uh, that doesn't mean anything. I can heat a home with solar thermal all through winter if I want to with an oil boiler. No one with an EPC assessor is going to be able to tick that box because they won't understand what it is. But with proper monitoring equipment, we can. So these are the opportunities that I think are coming. You can make yourself look a lot better with this transparency and with monitoring your heat uh, and energy usage. And don't be afraid of getting involved with heat pumps. The ones I'm talking at here are air source heat pumps, but they're air to air. And another myth is that uh, heat pumps are expensive 10 grand that wall hung unit is about 200 quid the outdoor units you can see they're about 508 quid each so you could have one of them in your home downstairs four kilowatts heating the whole of the door downstairs one of them wall hung units for about under a thousand uh we do it all the time it's a new industry air to air uh you won't get the rhi on air to air you only get it when it's a hydronic system which is heating up water but once again, another opportunity, and I like the thing that people have been saying about partnerships, lots of HEVAC engineers out there doing air-to-air -air already in, in, in your offices, in commercial buildings. And I think if they, they don't tend to like going into the domestic sector, but I think if some new partnerships form, you can partner up with HEVAC engineers, partner up with people that are into the monitoring, and you can create new businesses to get all these heat pumps, uh, like um, I think Tim mentioned, didn't he? 600,000 uh, by 2028, the government one. But the, there's lots of opportunities, but I always like to see people doing it properly and rather than all the tick box um, that we see. So that's my speech. Thank you very much. That's great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nathan. And um, yeah, would, I'd like to see you heat your house with uh, candles. That would look really good, I think. <laughs> as long as they're scented. <laughs> it's yeah. slight, slightly overwhelming, yes. You'll, you'll get into air quality issues then. <laughs> <laughs> could, be, could be quite, yeah, could be quite slightly noxious. Um, right, thank you. Thank you to all our speakers. That was really great. Um, wow, quite a, a, a tour de force through a whole range of different areas that, um, that cover this uh, particular sector. What I'd like to do, I know, hmm, I mean, we're meant to be trying to wrap this up by 12 o'clock. So we've, we've kind of overrun a little bit. So I'd like to try and get some focus on some uh, real sort of key questions that we can feed back to. This comes back to Nathan's points at the end there, which is really valuable about the opportunities. Because I mean, this, the whole thing to, this morning, the event is very much trying to work through where are these opportunities. And Tim's obviously flagged up stuff, Maria's flagged up stuff. Ben has, Nathan has, Hassan has, um, about touching upon these ideas, what, what will business, 
where can business go? Where are these opportunities? And particularly those, you know, within Kingston, both in terms of projects that we can think of introducing, but also in terms of making sure that business is ready for those projects. Um, pretty pointless having lots of projects in Kingston if we're just importing lots of skills and, uh, and business activity from lots of other places, really. Obviously, we want to try and make that as indigenous as possible. So from, from our perspective uh, and from the Chamber's perspective, it's clear that, you know, we've got some of these things. I, you know, I've seen some of the questions in the chat, very technical, very specific um, around the sort of heating and cooling aspect to it. But in terms of businesses, it's, for example, Tim, um, you know, the idea of this project there in Oxford being translated or taking sections of it to Kingston, um, what, what there, for example, what could we learn, what could be translated and brought into the Kingston environment that would then feed into all the other skill bases that we need that Nathan has talked about and Hassan's talked about? Um, I think, I think the, the two key areas for us um, that, that, that I'd like to see us look at are, are, are sort of EV charging and, uh, and heat. Um, you know, there's something quite specific about that project I talked about in that we're, we're connecting directly into this very high voltage 400 kV you know, national grid network. And that's going to be something that's, that's challenging to do here um, because it does depend on where your substations are. But it doesn't mean that we can't do that stuff on the local distribution network. And, and the heating is not connected to that sort of high voltage network. It is local distribution um, uh, networks uh, activity. But... Um, you know, the, the challenges are, are, are going to be around funding and, and how you can roll this stuff out, out at scale. So if, you, if you look, we look at heating, and I think that, you know, this is a massive opportunity for us. It's a massive challenge as well. One of the biggest, I think, um, you know, if, you, if you, you look at this, this, this target that the government has set down of 600,000 heat pumps, I think Neil, Neil mentioned early on, um, you know, by 2028, it's an enormous, enormous challenge and, and one that we just don't have, there's nothing in place at the moment to replace uh, the existing in, in incentive schemes to make that happen. So we, and with Kingston, it's again different from a council like Oxford, where we're, we're sort of being part of the, the sort of GLA and getting quite a lot of our funding uh, or not getting our funding from, from there. We have other sort of funding challenges, but I think that that that's clearly got to be an enormous part of a, of a, of a sort of energy strategy that we follow. So, you know, there's, there's huge opportunities there. How we kick that off in the absence of a national uh a, a, you know a, a national policy and an incentive support scheme is going to be is going to be a challenge but we may be able to get some money from from central london on that um but then on the ev side you know uh, again it's inevitable isn't it we are going to uh, we are going to move from from internal combustion engines to evs over the next you know 10 years uh, plus and we need the infrastructure in place and one way or another you know we've got to deliver that and that 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 will need work for the buses you know the the the, the council's fleet um will will move to you know to electric vehicles i mean that you know some we we just electrified some of the vehicles in oxford including a, a electric bin lorry etc this is all going to happen but we do need to be thinking now about where that infrastructure is going to go and and how we're going to source the amounts of power one of the challenges we face is that you know the grid is constrained i mean it's the local grid networks are constrained and we need to work with those um local grid operators to understand how we can get the levels of power we need for all this additional charging into the, the local area and at the right places. So, you know, those are the two, two areas. I think the battery storage is another thing, um, uh, you know, could help us, but there's enough to be going on there. Um, but, um, you know, I think we need to build this, build this into our strategy, but to, yeah, some, 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 some challenges to get over a lot of those related to funding one way or another. Great, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I suppose the same to Maria then as well. Obviously, we're thinking about the uh, the Brixton project. I mean, is there chance or opportunities here to translate that in some way to our local area? Yeah, I mean, the the, the project, it's, um, you know, we chose that uh, building because, uh, you know, there was an existing uh, plant. So, and um, what is important, there was already an existing very strong, uh, um, very strong activities around energy in the area uh, through a local partner um, called Repowering. So I think this is important because, to be honest, um, from a technical point of view, I mean, we can 
you know, uh, we can make it work. But we found out that, you know, having a company that has been on the grounds uh, for, for many years now, uh, running, um, I was just reading in the chat, there was a, a demon, right? Uh, in a, you know, that has been to the annual, annual uh, general meeting of, um, of Brixton Solar. So, you know, it's about, um, you know, having companies that have, have been actively involved in, uh, for example, uh, raising shareholders uh, funds to, to fund, uh, you know, uh, rooftop PV or uh, very active around, you know, providing advice on energy efficiency. I think this is almost like the, the, funda the fund foundations. And then uh, it's actually, you know, not that difficult to replicate uh, similar projects here in Brixton because the technology now actually after the pilot we know what works and what does not work also regulation we know you know what is required and what not but I think the movement as we say in Italy we say the movement the energy movement I think that's very important to create so we are a bit with Tim already in a, you know conversations so there is a Berylands uh, energy action group I don't know uh, Tim what's their official name that is about really growing the interest because ultimately you need people that are interested in this. I mean, it's um, people that take a bit more, you know, uh, yeah, rather than just paying the bills, but they want to know a bit more about that. Then yes, and if you have that, the foundation, then, you know, replication, I think it's pretty straightforward actually. Obviously the counselor, I mean, if, um, you know, they can maybe drive some of this, I think would be good because as an energy supplier, we find that uh, um, uh, it's almost like, um, oh, there is a, we have an interest in doing this thing because, you know, it's a, you know, you know, it's a, it's a business for us. But I think that, you know, if some of this, you know, some uh, grassroots uh, building on energy um, can be done by the council, I think it's actually, it's great because then, okay, it's a matter, okay, let's deploy the technologies, let's bring various partners into this and that's, you know, that's, uh, that's doable, definitely doable. I, I mean, in terms of what you've learned in terms of the pilot projects, et cetera, you know, you've got this, what, are the, what is the big, biggest barrier or challenge you think there? To get in this up and running. Okay, so I think um, the regulation. That's why I'm, I mean, I'm not a okay. you know, I'm I'm not a technical. I'm, I'm a technical person, but the regulation is not um, a barrier. But let's put it this way: um, it can create some additional complexity uh, in building these schemes. Uh, mainly because um, it's also about, you know, the protection of the customers. I mean, the, the building it's, uh, in, uh, that we have in Brixton, is actually, uh, it's council housing, actually. So some of the customers are what we would call the energy vulnerable customers. So let's say the challenge is, um, you know, a bit on the regulation and uh, how we communicate uh, these um, these offers, these opportunities, uh, because we need to, you know, uh, make sure that, uh, you see, we are testing something new, that's the thing. So explaining, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer market or, or just in general, you know, between, it's, it's something that, you know, you, you, know you, you need to, you know, communicate in the right way. Also, uh, differentiate it to the classical, electricity supply contract, which is fully regulated and fully, you know, yeah, full, uh, yeah, fully regulated. Hence, having a, a company like, for example, Repowering Brixton, so that knows, you know, the, it's been fully involved, trusted, and, you know, they have, a, I think it's quite, it's quite a useful, you know, to, to make it, uh, make it go. Also, I may say, I mean, you know, one thing of the project is that um, the other thing that was the challenge, I mean, as I say, technology worked, uh, you know, we have our, we, the platform was even built on using blockchain, just to let you know, so that we make it work. The other challenge was uh, COVID, the pandemic. So we were lucky that we managed to do all our work and installations and everything before it started. But I have to say, and it runs by itself, the system runs by itself, but, you know, we were planning to have more engagement, more face-to-face, -face, you know, you have to have this thing. And that was all, you know, post. So I think this is, a, yeah, 
Okay, no, that, that, that's great. Thank you very much for that headline stuff. Uh, right, I'm conscious that we've got about nine, we're just about nine minutes left. So I'm going to start to bring Hassan and Nathan and Ben back into the conversation as well. Um, I think from there's a lot of overlap there in terms of Hassan's uh, kind of interpretation here and Nathan's uh, this this kind of hands on training opportunities for business, what, what's going to happen within Kingston, etc. Are there synergies there, uh, Hassan and Nathan, between sort of the, the role of universities in this process and what Nathan's talking about and how we can bring that together? Because obviously Kingston is a, is a university town after all. Um, how do we start to think about that and, and bring these sorts of things together so that it will obviously engender more of a circular economy within Kingston? Hassan, do you want to go first on that? Yeah, thanks, Pete. Uh, <clears throat> I think the, the, the biggest challenge here is uh, the, the opportunities. We need to we need to find we need to realize the opportunities, basically. You know, in terms of, for example, I mean, going back to what uh, Tim and Maria was presenting, heat pumps, for example, what, what, what the, the issue is that the challenge is that 80% of the buildings in 2050 already exist now. So that the buildings are going to be standing in 2050, the 80% of them exist now. So the, the refurbishment is going to be a big major issue. And, and for this, uh, this creates, this might create job opportunities. Uh, I mean, uh, like retrofitting, uh, do we have the enhanced skills uh, for retrofitting and for supervision, for example? Oh, I've got some feedback on there. Can everybody please turn their mics off apart from the sand? I still hear music, actually. Yep. Can everybody? It yeah. might be Henry. Yeah, Henry. Yeah, I think Henry's got the got the message. That's great. Sorry, Hassan, away you go. Yeah. So, and 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 so, so what I meant to say is that you know we need to uh, we need to understand the the the, the opportunities basically. Uh, as I say, the the eighty percent of the buildings will be standing in twenty fifty that exist now. Uh, and how we are going to address this uh, with the existing? Uh, do we have the the right sets of skills for for the refurbishment and to achieve the government's target uh, of net zero carbon by 2050? Um, so and and also you know this is also related to to behavioral issues as well. Uh, so are we addressing this, you know, cultural and behavioral issues uh, and also local context, for example, like Kingston, Royal Borough of Kingston, local context is important. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, I think that, absolutely. I think that that's I think that's been replicated in, in some of the other talks as well. Uh, yeah, Nathan, so, so, so finally, so the, 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 we need to achieve the, the improved labor market position, basically achieving improved market labor market position. Uh, and by that, the university uh, can, can play a significant role. Correct. On, on a particular note, Pete, you know, I did a bit research on Briam in 2010, back in 2010. And, 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 and we all know that, you know, Briam encourages the use of like uh, ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, this kind of like that, you know. However, uh, as, I, as far as I'm aware, this is like active energy system, isn't it? So you need to consume energy in order to gain more energy. So I don't know how the what what the government's view is going to be, for example. So you spend it's not like a renewable or passive solar uh, energy system. So that is something uh, that needs to be considered as well. That's all from me. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you very much. So and then Nathan, before we finish off with Ben, um, Nathan, in terms of your interpretation of this process, what I mean, the, talk about the, the particularly the monitoring and the firms, you know, coming together around understanding the real the accuracy of this uh, process. Um, it, you know, what what do we need to do, therefore, in Kingston to to make sure that those opportunities are. are Achieve. Oh, have I muted? Yeah. Uh, well, I think one of the one of the things you could do quite easily is is all the 
Kingston's um, public buildings, you can um, properly monitor them um, and, and start something up where you can say, right, this is the energy we're, we're inputting, this is the energy we're outputting. And from that, you can sort of uh, start a, a proper plan. We tend to plan things from these EPCs and these other sort of funny ways of assessing energy that aren't really that accurate. Um, I noticed Patrick was shaking his head there when we mentioned skills, and he's right. We have got a... Uh, my cousin's not well known for saying, you know, heating isn't rocket science. It's a lot more complex. It involves thermodynamics, it involves fluid dynamics. You know, it is a complex industry. And unfortunately, we, um, not being disrespectful to the gas boiler industry, obviously, but when we transitioned over from oil to gas, we became the biggest gas boiler industry in the world until 2016. And we've now got a market that wishes to sustain that. And usually that means selling lots of boilers. And we train lots and lots of people up to be gas engineers, but we don't train them to be hydronic engineers. So they're very good at safely sticking a box on the wall, but they don't really know about the hydronics and the system. Um, when it comes to training, so training is actually my real expertise within the industry. So that's what I consult on how we train people. And we're getting, we're getting it a little bit wrong. We always think training is about courses. Now we want an outcome. We want highly skilled operatives. And the best way you're ever going to learn is actually learn on the job with some highly skilled people. So already we've got problems with apprenticeships. I've taught over a thousand young people and you'll find that most apprentices are with family members. And they're actually learning from people that actually aren't that high skilled. So you're perpetuating the problem. So everyone talks about apprenticeships, but unless you get the real good quality employers there to start with. So it doesn't matter whether you engender all these wonderful new courses around heat pumps, et cetera, et cetera. You still need that base, skill base. Um, to get a good outcome, everyone always thinks it's courses. And sometimes it's just resources. If I were to meet you all in, um, in, in London, I wouldn't go on an orienteering course to work out how to navigate London. I'd use a resource. I'd use the tube map. OK, and there's a lot of times you can use resources to achieve your outcome. If my if my electric, uh, I don't know, uh, if my chainsaw broke down, I wouldn't go on a, on a course to learn how to, to mend mechanical garden equipment. I'd look it up on a YouTube video, a resource. So there's we should be using resources more to skill our workforce rather than relying on courses. Education across the board, whether it's primary, secondary, university, further education, is quite a lucrative industry. Lots of people, lots of funding to pull down on. And we sometimes concentrate on that and we, we get it wrong. You know, I've been involved in skills training for 20 years <laughs> and we've still got a low skill workforce. So something's going on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's what I so, but come back to the monitoring. Yeah. Go, start with, with your own sort of council buildings. Great. Get, Thanks. Get involved with monitoring them. Yeah. Thanks, Nathan. Right. And the last word I've got to give to Ben because we're pretty much out of time. But Ben, from your perspective, thank you for introducing you your service and your company. Uh, what role do you see that playing within Kingston and within Kingston's economy? Just what you, last last few minutes on that one. Yeah, well, I guess I'm, the main thing I wanted to get across today was that there are significant opportunities to not only reduce your climate impact, but in doing the same, but in doing that generally, what reduces your climate impact is a more efficient way of doing things. So I guess that there's, I'm sure there are opportunities for us to come and work in Kingston. Um, and if there are big, big blocks of work that we could be doing, then we are, we're more than happy to do that. And undoubtedly our service will continue to expand and we'll cover bigger areas. But more the point that I was keen to get across was that generally that which is green is also efficient, is also good business. Yep. And um, we found this particular niche of using bikes to move very large items around and move people around. But there are a thousand other niches that would also bring climate benefits while also bringing benefits to the businesses that come up with the, um, those ways of doing things and that implement those ways of doing things. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Right. And that leaves us four seconds, three seconds and two to say, you know, uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, breakout room watch your closing 114 seconds. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to everybody who put uh, those both technical and general questions in the chat. And hopefully people have been able to respond to that from our speakers. Uh, that's been really valuable. Um, in theory, now we do have a 